And we'll start with um, our Bellevue School District regular board meeting, and we'll start with roll call. You go. Could we have that yep. screen? Thank you. Jay Norris. Christine Chu. Dima Sarafan. Joyce Shuey. Carolyn Watson. Kurt Jarber, superintendent. And today we're very happy to have a student from Big Picture School. Dominic, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dominic Samieri, and I'm a senior at Bellevue Big Picture. Thank you. Um, Dominic, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and thereafter in the land acknowledgement? Of course. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And for the land acknowledgement, we acknowledge that we are on the indigenous land of the Coast Salish peoples who have reserved treaty rights to this land, specifically the Duwamish and Snoqualmie tribes. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. We reflect on the historic context that brings us to reside on this land and accept responsibility to interrupt erasure. We commit to an ongoing partnership with the Snoqualmie tribe as we listen to, learn from, and lead with their guidance. Thank you. At this time, I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second it. If the, I see no um, objections, I will assume by unanimous consent that we approve the agenda. If there's no objection, uh, the agenda is approved. At this time, um, I would ask Dominic to take over the mic and tell us about yourself in the form of a student update. Thank you so much. So, um, as I said earlier, I'm Dominic Samieri. I'm a senior at Bellevue Big Picture, and I've been going to Big Picture since I was in sixth grade, so this is my seventh year there. Um, I've really enjoyed my time at Big Picture, um, especially in high school, and especially because of two parts of the curriculum. One is internships, which is a staple of Big Picture and is which, and which is often talked about when you talk about Big Picture. And the other is freedom projects, which are not talked about as much, but personally I feel are even more fun and even more valuable. So um, as some of you may know, Big Picture does internships. Students don't actually have classes on Thursdays. Um, so today I actually came uh, from school doing my virtual internship instead of classes. Um, and usually students will either go out to a work site and get uh, hands on experience there or participate in a virtual internship and learn from their mentors virtually. Um, that's especially been useful over quarantine this year. Um, I've really enjoyed those. I've had some great internships. I've been able to do a game demo. Um, and right now I'm working with a company called the IDMA3 to create a um, demo web page or a web form that they can show to one of their clients. Um, I've also really enjoyed the Freedom Projects a Big Picture. Uh, this is something that I don't feel like a lot of people know about. Um, but for the last month of school in our social studies and language arts classes, we're actually able to design our own project and do that. Um, that has been really fun. I actually have one of my freedom projects with me right here. Um, I made a soundboard, basically just a grid of buttons. Um, and those have been really valuable in teaching me about um, my career path and my interests. Um, on that note, I am a senior and I, I was told that I should talk a little bit about myself as well. So um, college is obviously the first thing that comes up there. Um, I've been applying for colleges recently, and um, I got my first letter of acceptance yesterday for um, WPI, and they have a robotics program. And one of the reasons that I wanted to apply there was because of the internships that I've had and the freedom projects that I've done, as well as um, robotics, which I do at Sammamish High School. That's another thing that I hear come up a lot when people talk about Big Picture is the lack of opportunities, especially with extracurriculars. But what's great is you can do extracurriculars at your home school. So I'm actually able to be on the Sammamish Robotics team, and that's been really exciting. And I'm really excited for next month when we get our kickoff and get to do that. But anyway, enough about me. I'll let you get on with your board meeting. Thank you so much. So, so Dominic, um, this is Christine too, one of the board directors, and um, I get the privilege tonight of asking you a follow-up question. So I would like to know a little bit more about the internship um, 
work that you do and also the the freedom projects maybe a little bit you can weave in but one of the things i'm wondering is those sound like absolutely fabulous opportunities i'm wondering um are your experiences representative in your your um experience and view of of the average quality and opportunity that others get there do people have equitable um access to the same levels of opportunities what level at what what level does the school help you find and procure those internships and those projects and how much of it do you kind of have to have outside help and mentors with and um, are there any things that you can suggest that would make that those particular pro programs even stronger for the next classes who come after you at Big Picture? Yeah, so um, there are so many diverse experiences with internships. I wouldn't venture to say that mine are representative of everybody's, but um, I do feel that everybody has um, an equitable shot at getting these internships. Now, as a senior, I'm older and I'm more experienced, so it's oftentimes easier for me to get internships. I mean, trying to find essentially a job at 14 years old as a freshman in high school is pretty hard, um, but everybody goes through those years. And once you gain experience and you become older, um, it does become easier. One thing that has been um, a challenge for a lot of students is getting an internship. That's, I guess, part of the adventure is learning how to search for an internship and how to communicate effectively, how to do informational interviews and just how to essentially get a job. Um, but now there's been much more of a push to help students with that, especially with these crazy times that we're in with COVID-19. Um, now there's a lot more support around that, which is great because now we have lots of students doing lots of different things, especially things that they really want to do. So um, I think that our program is constantly improving. Um, I think that getting more awareness around it and really talking to the community more and getting even more opportunities would be fantastic and that would be one great way to improve our program but um, i think it's a great way for all students to really get hands-on learning and a topic that they enjoy um, in the real world from great people and great mentors so, yeah. thank you for that and and just one follow-up clarifying question um and you talked about getting more support now this past year for for like job prep, job up, you know, job interview, et cetera. Um, did that come from the school or from some outside organization or who provided that and, and was everyone able to access it and, and did you avail yourself of it or were you kind of past that need or, or where were you at? Yeah, so um, it's largely come from the school, especially since last year we weren't really there. Usually internships are required, but last year because we were doing virtual learning, we couldn't require them. Um, I mean, it would have been really unfair to require every student to get a virtual internship. So um, the sophomores this year, as well as the freshmen, are now new students. So we have a much higher population of students now who don't have experience getting these internships. So there's been um, more help from the school and more staff members uh, participating in reaching out to people and getting opportunities for students and introducing them to new people just to um, make it easier for students to get involved in this program and start learning about it more um, so that they don't have to get all of these things themselves as 14 or 15 year olds that don't have any experience. Now, personally, I have had enough internships and uh, had enough time to prepare beforehand that I didn't need as much help, which was really nice. And I think the goal of helping students more is that eventually they won't need that help anymore, right? Um, further on in the internship program and further on in their life when they're eventually searching for jobs and starting their careers. Well, thank Thanks. you so much for all that information and for sharing your experiences. That's actually wonderful for us to hear. And I also would just like to wish you the best of luck as you go through all the rest of the senior experiences and then the big transition. So congratulations thank so and thank you so much for your time and your thoughts tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Dominic. So we're going to move to uh, 1.6, our acknowledgements. Uh, this is a very uh, eventful month. I'm going to try to do justice by reading what we have here on our acknowledgement of um, information and holidays. Um, we had in the month of December Hanukkah Special Education Day. 
uh, International Day of People with Disabilities, Computer Science Education Week, Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, Rohatsu, International Migrants Day, Winter Solstice is coming up, Festivus, Christmas Day, and Kwanzaa. So I would ask all members of our community, if you have a holiday that you celebrate that you know is coming up, we would welcome you're um, sharing that with us to ensure that we are being inclusive of all the members of our community. So thank you. With that, we're going to move to item two, uh, the consent agenda, which is now we have now two minutes. Um, so I would ask at this time, uh, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Is there discussion or desire to pull anything out? Um, my wondering is about the um, school improvement plans. Mm -hmm. Those are effectively the plans by which like all of our schools are doing their work. And in some ways, they're actually more reflective of the work of the district and what in many ways than than even like an annual plan or strategic plan because they are what is happening at every school. And we really haven't discussed them or or done much with them. And so um, I'm slightly uncomfortable in, in just kind of voting for them without any discussion, without an, any um, understanding from from our superintendent. But I I don't I think they have to be approved. Is it by January or is it this month? Well, they did come up in mid November, and at yeah. that time, um, what I had I went back and listened. I think you'd made a motion to just move them to the consent agenda for this meeting. Um, and that's what was done to give you more time to read them. But I do appreciate what you're saying. I think I think as a practical matter under the policy, they're already being used and implemented. Yeah. Um, I would ask that we maybe consider two things. We could um, approve them because I think they are needed to be done before January. But I think maybe what you're going to is even though they are tied to and reflective of our annual plan, meaning they tie back to them. I think many of us have felt for some time that the template that gives rise to a lot of the information may not actually be giving us super useful information. And so I wonder, and I'm back to a wondering to you, is this something we should have as a maybe collective study session to review? I think um, I think you're hitting on the the direction I would go, which is I we're half well, we're not halfway through, but we're we're month, months into the school year. We're not going to go changing the school improvement plans for this year unless there's some like harm being done somewhere. So, or, or we're unlikely to do that because it's not going to be productive. But what I what I think you're hitting on is longer term. It would be great for us to have a deeper discussion of them, of the process involved in them, of how they're used, because I think these are yet one more um, document and report that um, seem to be done sometimes in the spirit of compliance rather than the spirit of of showcasing the real work that's being done in the schools like because we've they i don't know why but I, like there's just a lot of taxes that we put on people with reports or the way that they're received so i think our goal as a district is to ensure that people are articulating the real targets they're working towards and then having a chance to tell us about the progress on them and not trying to find the right research based measures to tell us about and write reports about and do lots of like digging on. So I, I think um, it would be great if we could have a study session both about the content of these, but also about the process and how the board um, fits into them, but also how the how the district is using them so we can know how to use them as well. OK, so I'm going to in the spirit of, of a room full of people that we know also want to speak, I'm going to suggest we do two things. We approve the consent agenda, which includes this, the SIPs, school improvement plans. But to your point that I, I look to, I will say spring, um, for a study session where we actually examine the SIPs with the point of view of considering should they be revised, the templates. They won't impact this school year because we know that they've already been developed. But if we can give feedback soon enough, we could impact them for next school year and maybe get the kind of information we maybe want more. Mm -hmm. And I think we need time to talk through it, mm -hmm. including with staff. So with that, I'll take that an sounds action great. for that. Thank you. OK, so do I have, uh, let's vote then on the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 OK, so with that, we approve the consent agenda 
and we move to public comment. Um, at this time, uh, we've actually doubled our time for public comment. We lost a few minutes, um, but we will make sure we adhere to the time we doubled, which was 20 minutes, which will allow us to have more public comments than usual. So um, I would this time read some important comments about our public comment. Um, these are the guidelines, and I ask those who are going to speak tonight to please consider them. The board is grateful to receive public comment, and we appreciate the thoughtful input of our community. Because of the limitations of our calendar, we generally limit this time to 10 minutes per meeting. As I just said, we're expanding it to 20 because we, we knew we'd have many people here tonight. If you'd like to address the board on an issue, please limit your remarks to not more than two minutes. The maximum number of comments we can hear, to maximize, excuse me, the number of comments we can hear, please use only the time you need to make your statement. Um, you may provide written documentation to the board secretary that could be included as part of the official record. Now, to anybody who's speaking tonight, please know that we have a counter at the front which has your time, so that you have a sense that you're not suddenly taken aback if your time runs out. Um, please also just keep in mind that we do have some rules that we have to follow. Um, we might uh, interrupt you um, as a speaker if you don't follow a certain standard of, of civility that we impose on ourselves as well. So an example of uncivil comments would be include those that are comments that are libelous or slanderous, that invade someone's privacy, are obscene or indecent, or that violate our school district policy or procedures regarding harassment, intimidation, bullying, or discrimination, or that incite on an unlawful act on school premises or violate a lawful school regulation or that create a material and substantial disruption to the operation of our board meeting. So um, at this time, we would at invite Ms. Gisbarich to please project the names of our speakers and we'll go in this order and we'll do our best to ensure that you each have two minutes. Um, and so I would ask just if you see your name following someone else's name, maybe just queue up so that we can hear from everybody. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Ingraham. Hi, I'm Joel Ingraham, a district parent. Tonight, I'd like to thank the Teaching and Learning Department for their progress on K2 literacy and helping BSD meet new requirements under state law for early literacy screening, dyslexia screening, and early literacy interventions. The district has successfully used Dibble's literacy assessment in all K2 classrooms. The district has committed to providing all K2 teachers Haggerty phonemic awareness resources to support early literacy. These daily 10 to 15 minute lessons will help build excellent pre phonics skills that are critical in early literacy. This is an excellent start and we should celebrate the progress made, knowing full well that there is more work needed. Now with the Washington legislative session starting in January, I call on the school board to make early literacy an official BSD legislative priority for 2022. This fall, the Washington State PTA approved resolution 1842, improving literacy and education outcomes, which calls for the state to fully train teachers as well as future teachers, provide funding for curriculum, and reading materials that align with the science of reading and to align classroom instruction with evidence based practices and reading science. Please join the Washington State PTA and send a clear message to the state legislature that the Bellevue School District not only understands the critical importance of the science of reading for early literacy success, but also the districts expects that the state fully funds districts to be able to meet the needs of students and to help ensure all students are reading by third grade. Thank you. Thank you. Ava Carroll? Carroll, yeah. Um, my name is Ava. I'm from Bellevue High School and I want to read off you off to you the um, Bellevue walkout demands um, that protest the sexual assault within the Bellevue School District. Our first demand is to create a specific sexual assault form. Right now we only have a HIB form and the questions on the HIB form are not made to address the trauma and internal suffering that um, sexual assault survivors are facing at the times that they're reporting. 
Our second demand is to remove the why do you think this happened form question from the HIB form. While a sexual assault form is being made, since we don't have one right now, the HIB form should at least be humanized. Why do you think this happened is not a question we should be asking sexual assault survivors that places blame on the victim and is not an environment that's supportive for someone who is in the midst of the brave act of reporting. Our third demand is a transparent administrative response that's communicated with the victim. So much of trauma left over from sexual assault is being isolated and not knowing what's going on. And a process that leaves our victims in the dark doesn't help support that, doesn't address that at all. Our fourth demand is to place a specific sexual assault counselor in each Bellevue School District school. Our counselors right now are already overloaded. They can't handle class schedules. They can't handle mental health crises and college recommendations letters. They are overboarded with too much work and to place the added workload and labor of fully supporting our victims of sexual assault within the Bellevue School Districts is too much to ask of four counselors for one high school. Um, I will let my counterparts read off the rest of our demands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Devin Israel Cabanella. Did I say that right? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Devin Cabanella. I'm a parent with children in elementary school and middle school here in the district. And my family is in its fifth generation in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, the last time I spoke to the board was before clo COVID closure happened. And that was to warn about the potential of Asian American discrimination among students. Um, that issue became evident. And uh, tonight I'm here about something else. I'm, I'm here to question what's the approach in the district for how we're supporting students and family about concerns of sexual assault. And my concern about these approaches are at the systems level. I am an administrator in education in another area, but looking at Bellevue, I notice from old data, the foreign born population is around 40%. Uh, that number is probably higher now. Uh, what is the immigrant population today? I raise this number because it represents a social dynamic. And in addition to a generation gap that happens amongst children, and how is Bellevue engaging with students and their families related to the cultural dynamics? We have flash training, but is flash training sufficient to meet the cultural dynamics that are going on, especially in Bellevue? which may be very different from the rest of the state. Does Bellevue know what the comfort level of children is in reporting sexual issues to adults? And there's a potential there that can be very different for children of immigrants. The potential for underreporting and avoidance and conflict uh, can be exacerbated by the different demographics that we have. So, I recommend that Bellevue explore better culturally responsive engagement with families. How can we reduce the stigma I, around I sexual conversations? And uh, there are many social service organizations that are culturally responsive in our area. I encourage you all to seek them out. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, next we have VC. Just so you know, I'll do my best if the if the clock starts to flash, I'll do my best to let you know, but I'll try to give you a little bit of margin. So please go ahead. OK, thank you. Hi, I'm VC and I'm here to make public comment from me and a group of students in the district. I go to big picture. OK. Dear school board members, we urge you to please take action to assault allegations in our district. We know you have the resources and ability to handle these causes of assault properly, and you choose not to, and instead are causing more harm. When students bring forward concerns, you end up blaming and punishing them. We cannot understand why you choose to continue and make these decisions. This is the reason we do not feel safe or school at our school. 
This is the reason we find ourselves feeling unsupported and ignored at school. The place where we should, at the very minimum, be heard and given kindness. This is why we don't feel properly supported. We want compassion. We want support and validation. Please help us feel safe in a place that is meant for learning community and kindness. I hope that the school board can work in collaboration with the walkout demands of BSD schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christy Schwesinger. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak tonight. I'm Christy Schlesinger, a parent in the district. Um, I have uh, two children at um, one of the elementary schools, and we just want to thank the BSD board and uh, district for enriching the literacy programs this year with the dyslexia law that is rolling out. There's a lot to unpack. We've been very patient with the, you know, the rollout of this, the Dibbles assessment, the RAN assessment. Communication with parents will be key to, you know, unlocking this next step with interventions. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight is part of the dyslexia law is training for teachers. At our school, there's only, I think, two or three teachers who have structured literacy training. And the way that the law is written, that's not in compliance. I don't think those teachers will be working with all the students who are being flagged during this assessment. So we'd really like to see the district push to move more liter structured literacy training to all the teachers in the district. Um, my name is Ava. I'm in fourth grade and it is important for teachers to be learning this so it can help kids like me that have dyslexia or dyscalculia or stuff like that. So it's important to do this. Thank you. Thank you both. Next we have Priyal Sahai. My name is Priyal Sahai. All of you should know me, but if you don't, I'm not surprised considering BSD's absolute lack of a response to all sexual violence, or in this case, my sexual assault. What makes me genuinely concerned is not your lack of response. It's not even your policy. It's your kids. I worry for every single one of you up here genuinely. I'm certain you have kids and you as parents through your actions are telling them that no matter what happens to them, no matter if they speak up, no matter what action they take, they are powerless. You can sit there and defend yourself. <laughs> you can say that it's because of due process or that you give us HIV training or that you must treat people equally. We all know that isn't true. If you want to treat people equally, you would protect your students. A crime is a crime. You should be treating it as such. What if it was your kid, huh? Who was touched, violated, harmed? Exactly. I've talked to principals, assistant principals, counselors, therapists, no matter what, you're wrong. Me, our demands. The world has its eyes on you right now. And NBC National is putting out an article today. KUOW already has, NPR already has. Alumni, survivors, victims, all of us are speaking out against you. Everybody is watching you and you can't afford to make the wrong decision here. No, you and I both know that, especially in such a progressive district and state where Interlake is ranked one of the highest in the district, in the state, in the, in the country, you can't afford to make the wrong choice. You don't have a choice here. And you've already made the wrong decision time and time again. It is your duty to protect us. It is your duty to make the right decision. <laughs> We've all moved on somehow. All of us survivors, and I know that clock's about time out, so I know all those, all of us survivors have done our best to move on. I'm never gonna move on from Stockholm, PTSD. You think that's gonna go away? Nah, it's affected my relationships my entire life for four years and all of my friends. We're never moving on from that. You have a choice now. The world has its eyes on you. Make the right one. Next we have Jean Yu.
Hi, my name is Jean. I'm a student at Bellevue High School, and today I'm going to be reading um, this statement from Interlake Students Walkout, the walkout organizers. So we're asking the Bellevue School District to review and change their policies regarding the handling of sexual and physical assault cases brought to their attention. And we have witnessed cases being continuously mishandled due to administration and teachers' hands being tied through the complex and extremely ineffective policies currently in action. And we have watched victims struggle through a more painful than necessary process. And we are telling you that we currently do not feel safe and protected and that we need change. And as the district has emphasized through our curriculum um, of the value of peaceful protest, we expect the support of the school and the district so we can work together towards a solution. A solution that includes separating suspected, suspected perpetrators from victims during thorough investigations, allowing you for organizers to return to their education and re-evaluation of the current sexual assault policy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Yu, please. My name is Sue. I'm a junior at Bellevue High School, and we've earlier, or just before, heard the demands of the Interlake walkout. Earlier, Ava Carroll started the walkout demands of, the Bell of Bellevue High School, and I would like to continue reading off the Bellevue High School walkout demands. Our next demand is mandatory staff training on how to respond when a student reports, and this training must have emphasis on support, guidance, openness, and sensitivity to victims, especially in terms of language. We hope that students want to support their students the best they can, and oftentimes trusted students or staff are the first, per first people that survivors turn to, and staff need to know how to support students and guide them through that often traumatic process. And our last demand is edited health and sex ed curriculum on consent, grooming, partner violence, and terminology around assault. And this would be at sex ed for all grade levels, and it would be created in collaboration with Bellevue School District High School students. Sex ed that we see in elementary, middle, and high school is very inadequate, and it skips over content and learning that needs to be taught. None of us were taught about rape and grooming in elementary school, even though those concepts are so important to learn. And there are ways to teach these concepts to younger grades. And high schoolers and actual students in this district can speak much better to what we actually need to learn. And they must be involved in this process of creating better sex, sex ed and health curriculum. And in that was um, our last demand, but in response to all the Bellevue School District walkouts, I just want to point out that BSD has not made clear what they're going to do to change at all, and we are concerned that nothing will change, and that can't be the way things should be. Thank you. Next, we have Vic Dongan. Hello. I'm going to start this off by saying I shouldn't even have to be here. Like, this shouldn't have to be a thing, okay? Let me just start that off. You guys have the resources to fix all of this issue, yet you don't use them? You don't fix them? You have all of this sexual assault, sexual harassment, all of this being spoken about, and you do nothing. You don't do anything about it, and I expect change after this. Because as somebody that has experienced school harassment, sexual assault from my school, and so much more, that sticks with me. And I can't be asked, hmm, why do you think that happened? Why do you think you're, you had this happen to you that you couldn't do anything about? I don't know. Was it my fault? Did I? No. You shouldn't be asking minors why they think that they got sexually assaulted that shouldn't be a question that shouldn't even be a thing on the question list because that's sorry for my language shitty and i don't want to see that that needs taken off and i expect that to be taken off and i feel as if teachers and people that are helping these sexual assault victims should be taught how to deal with it. 
they need to be taught how to deal with these situations so they're not just messing around with some student who has experienced emotional trauma and physical trauma and they're just being like oh well get well soon here's a card on why why that happened to you do you want to talk to a therapist that won't really help you that much do you want to stick with this ptsd and hope you get better and we're not going to do anything about the kids i expect the people that have sexually assaulted me i expect them to be out of the school but as soon as i speak on it they're like oh get hope that's hope that gets better for you but we're gonna do nothing i see that blink and i'm gonna go sit back down the last commenter is Meenal Gupta. You got this one. You got this. Hi, my name is Meenal Gupta, and I am the mom of my of daughter Priyal Sahai. That's my daughter there. She just spoke to you guys, and um, I'm here to support her and all the kids who have gone through this. I was there at the Interlake High School protest also to support her. And it was amazing to see they started with four or five kids and how many kids came out of the crowd to tell their stories. It was heart wrenching to see that. And um, today I'm here to do my part to support these kids, support my daughter, support anyone who's going through this. And I beg of you to please do the right thing. These could be your kids. I had never expected my child who is a freshman in her third month to be sexually assaulted. It has changed our life forever. And we were not even informed. The school did not reach out to us. We do get an email today that there is a TikTok prank going on. You know, the, the kids are doing this Please keep them safe. Does not, is it not their responsibility for my child who is there physically in the school and she's reporting stuff that the school informs the parent that something is going on, that your child is not safe or there's some, you need to know, I need to know. Please read this. These are our demands. There are lots of parents like us that are hurting. Just be transparent with the community about the problem. Please tell us. Why didn't the school reach out to me? Why had I had to learn all this through my child? And the child was told to be silent to be silence. Why silence? I don't know. My time's up. I'm gonna go, but please do something. Please. Thank you. That ends our public comment. We thank everyone who came tonight. We do need to move to the next um, part of our agenda, which is number four, our superintendent update. Superintendent Jarvis. Thank you, President uh, Serafin. I have uh, three reports that have been presented to you and I'd like to introduce those by way of highlighting. Okay, you have, some, I, are you, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to interrupt and ask, like we just had a whole collection of people come out and tell us about something and their whole point is they're not being heard or listened to and I know in general that we don't make comments after public comment, that, we, that these are big topics that require a lot of significant attention and work and we're not going to do that in two minutes. But what I do think is really important is that beyond thank you, I want to at least on behalf of myself say I hear you and I appreciate that you are here and we are and we will stay committed to taking care of the safety of our students. You're, the way that the board works is slower than the way that the district operations work. So you'll see different things happening in different places. But I know that we, I, I can speak for myself, but I'm probably sure I can speak for this board, that we are committed to the safety of our students, including every one of you. And I am grateful that you are here tonight. You're not gonna get more from us at this moment. And the board doesn't, doesn't 
make day to day decisions about some of the things you've asked about. Those are things that the district itself will work on as well. And and I but we, we I can't dialogue with you, but I want you to know that we hear you. That this isn't just going in. This isn't just going in one ear and you'll see more actions. You'll definitely see more actions. I know that I have been talking to the superintendent about some things to do, but we thank you for coming out and and they're like this isn't the end. So I just don't feel like it's right to just say, hey, thanks for coming. I, there's way more to be said. We're probably going to want to talk to you some more, but thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for the time. There's a lot of statements like the future, but not like what the tangible next steps are and how the, that's going to be communicated. It's been four years. Your time for day to day is done. So and our pain at least deserves recognition. There have been no district emails. Four nothing years. And no, nothing. Nothing. All you nothing. do is just sit around and do nothing and just let it go on. Because we understand that there is a process, but there needs to be at least an email to address the parents about what's going on. There are parents that don't even know what is happening right now because it has not been addressed in a single email. All you do is sit around and do nothing. 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 N
a community that has changed and the demographics are very different than they were even five years ago or 10 years ago. And the fact that the staff is in fact changing. You will also see that in the administrative staff, in the principals and the assistant principals, where we've gone from a little over three quarters, 76% to 66%. Uh, and the reason I point those out is that you are seeing the evolution and the change of the staff. You're seeing the intense work of the HR department to try to do exactly what I think was spelled out in the, the goals and the direction for the district. Uh, one of the things we get to do now this spring, and we anticipate that uh, we will be allowed to do in-person recruitment, which has not been in the, the cards for these basically last two spring seasons. Uh, so we're very hopeful that we can even make an additional gains. Uh, it is also important, and I think it's been dealt with in previous uh, goal setting and departments, is, is to not just be able to select staff, but to be able to retain staff. So in January and February, we will be engaging the staff in something we'll call stay interviews to learn more about what motivates them to stay in the Bellevue schools and obviously any messages that we can we can gain. I want to not, I'll leave the rest of the report to, to you and the data and the statistics, but I think it's significant that as we watch a system change, as we watch the personnel change in a way to more closely match the demographics of our parents, of our families, of our children in the schools, it's one of the most significant changes that you can watch happen. And it doesn't mean we're done. It doesn't mean we can rest. But it does mean that we're making headway. And I, I present that to you as a superintendent of an item of note. I am going to ask for uh, questions be, as I finish. But what I'd like to do, with your permission, was to do all three reports and then take any, any comments. I'll, I'll keep them brief. The, the second report that I, I want to highlight is one that uh, as we've begun the levy push to educate people about the levy coming up, one of the highlights we've used is that the, if it were left up to the state prototypical model, we would have three nurses in our health services and instead we have 23. The, the reality is that I'd like to report on the health services and share some things with you. Uh, the primary goal, I believe, whatever was printed or said or planned three years ago became how do we keep children and staff safe? How do we keep our students safe in the system? Uh, secondly, as you have watched in first responders and hospitals, uh, there's been a tremendous toll taken on the, the, those who provide the services, and I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, because we have a nursing staff that has been working endlessly to ensure our students and staff are able to learn and teach and really enable what we've done this fall. And they are exhausted and I want to note that. So success to Carrie Lang and the entire group, the, all the people represented there, we have provided a safe return to in-person learning because of one group in particular. Doesn't mean that everybody else in the district hasn't worked tirelessly to make it happen. But without our, our health department, without our school nurses, we would not have been able to do this. We've enabled a system to operate. We've implemented the mitigating me measures, vaccine clinics, tra contact tracing, the diagnostic testing, the additional testing. And that's all at the grace of our nurses and our, our health department. Uh, and because of their efforts, because of the mitigating factor and the system that they have set up, we have had extraordinarily limited cases of spread. We recognize we're not out of the woods, that the pandemic is not over, that we could be watching this Omicron uh, and change the world around us. But at this point, we had had only two outbreaks and, and zero shutdowns. We are hearing word of a wrestling tournament that took place and has begun to spread to several places. We don't know the full ramifications, but I do have to comment that uh, to Carrie Lang and the entire nursing staff, 
uh, we owe a debt of gratitude for being able to be where we are in December of 2021. Without them, we could not have carried that. But in there is a challenge, and I alluded to that. We have a very exhausted, tired staff and the concerns about losing our highly trained staff. We have to find ways to support them. We have to find ways to, if we can in any way, reduce some of the pressure on them. Uh, if I may, Director Chu and, and I were on a meeting last Friday with the health department, and I made a proposal to the health department that four of the east side districts uh, would like to join together in a, a pilot program to look at maybe a different way of doing some of the contact tracing that would not exhaust our staff as thoroughly. It can't be limited to that, but it needs to be looked at in whatever we can do. The reason we picked on that one in particular is because with the contact tracing we've been doing, we have had 1.3% uh, finding, so we've had a tremendous effort that proves that we are operating safely and can do that. And that if we were to go to a, something like a sampling, that we could in fact still operate very safely and, and make it work. Uh, I want to caution and oh, I guess alert the community and the board. There are some things that are taking a back seat as we choose to say this is what we have to do. So some of the routine vision and hearing screens are, are not getting done the way they would get done. Uh, we do risk a long term impact and we can't stay there forever. We're not able to chart all the visits to the health clinic the way we would normally do. We've not been able to conduct the school entry immunization checks with the same fidelity. The nurses are stretched uh, and one of the things they're doing in Bellevue that's very unusual and it's also taking a toll is that we're following up with every family who calls their child in sick for any reason. So not just COVID, but in the pandemic. Uh, and I think if uh, Carrie Lang were here and I could represent her, that's one that is taxing the system to the point we may not be able to continue at that pace. That as we enter the cold and sniffles and, and runny nose season, to be able to contact every family personally to follow up on it is reaching a proportion that is overtaxing our, our staff. So I offer that with the highest thanks to the health department and our, our nurses for the work they've done. And I think it's been magnificent. And I do think we have to look as a system of how do we uh, figure out what won't be done, how to figure out to relieve the burden, and uh, as we go along to retain this wonderful staff and not watch them uh, fall in exhaustion. So with that, I'd conclude that report. While I'm giving kudos, uh, the third one is transportation. How can you not give credit to the transportation department for what they have done? We took a very large department of the school district, a very vital part of the school district, and uh, on March 12th, basically locked the door and said, you can't do what you do. Uh, in spite of that, as we opened sorry, this- Sorry, you meant March 12th, 20. March 12th, uh, I'm sorry, 2020. Yes. Uh, when the schools were shut down by the, by the governor. So we virtually watched the transportation units wondering what was in store for them. Uh, I and others lobbied the state to say, you can't just lay off all the bus drivers and shut down the transportation unit and then try to reopen it at some future date uh, because we need them and we need them ready. So I want to offer right at the beginning, uh, all driver positions are currently filled with two additional relief drivers and three on call. I think you know if you read the headlines and you heard the news, the districts that have had to cut back routes and are searching desperately for drivers. Yes, I see Don out there. He'll hire any of you who want to drive a bus. Uh, if you'll go see him, he'll arrange for your training. Uh, so we need drivers. I don't want to imply that we don't, but I will give them great, great credit. As a unit, our drivers stayed with us. They stayed with us through some extraordinary circumstances. And I think that was because of people like Don, it was because of people like Melissa, Navita, and really a, a tremendous staff that, that worked with them. Uh, while doing this, they uh, 
improved the pickup and drop off rate from 50% at the beginning of the year to 80% now. And uh, that was in the most dire of recovery circumstances and putting it together. I went to a scan card so that we would know exactly, and partially that was back to the contact tracing, who was on the bus if somebody happened to come down and uh, adding the scan cards and getting 90% use, uh, not giving me an actual number, 7,294 people used the communications app. Uh, and this enables the district to know which students are on which buses. It's, it's a safety issue that will benefit us for forever in terms of that old scramble of who was on the bus and who had been dropped off. Uh, there have been zero COVID cases linked to any bus ride in the Bellevue School District. Uh, so safely transporting students on time, providing pre-pandemic service levels, improving the communication with families, and making the system able to run and get, get families to. I would say that transportation unit uh, deserves every gold star or whatever accommodation that we could we could provide them they do have challenges i do not want to imply that that life is good and don is falling asleep in the afternoon uh, because it's so good uh, we have labor shortages and so uh, i hope if there's some public person listening that could take an interest even for a while to to get a cdl with the support of the bus transportation we need people uh, and we need people to help us. Uh, the increased traffic, I will, <laughs> I guess I'll comment as a newcomer to Bellevue. I'm discovering how long it takes me to get from one place to another, uh, even though it's not a long distance, and how long those red lights can actually be and how the, the buses navigate. I just have to speak in admiration, but it is time and it's getting worse. So we're gonna have to think about what can we do as a system that will perhaps give us uh, uh, some relief in the future? We are uh, maintaining assigned seating as the ridership grows and, and uh, because of the contact tracing, that's a, that's a hardship. Uh, that's something that bus drivers don't normally do for all, all kids on assigned seating. Uh, there is time required still to clean and disinfect buses uh, and stay on time. And uh, lastly, that as we return some of our virtual students now back to in-person, it's adding to the, the ridership. So there will be some modifications to routes that will start in January as we add more and more students. Uh, and we will also continue the ro strong recruiting efforts. So uh, I think, again, Don and Melissa and others will be putting up even more big signs that says drivers needed. And I think if I could do anything to assist them is to put this word out that they need help, uh, but they also are a marvelous outfit to work for. So I'm going to just with that, that would conclude my sort of brief report and I'd be happy. Madam yes, President. you asked earlier um, about the fact that your superintendent update came after public comment. Um, and we did that mainly because we didn't want to delay public comment. But I would like to just ask, I think Dr. Chu, not only was I okay with you stepping in, I'm glad you did uh, because you're right, you, your comments were reflective, I think, of the sentiment of all board members. But I think this is a good time, Dr. Jarvis, to point out a few things because all board members are also responding to direction we received from outside counsel of our unique role as board, board members in terms of our need to potentially, as you advised us, um, May, we may have to serve in a um, disciplinary review posture. And for that reason, I think members of the community may need to know that there's a reason why we have to ensure that we're complying with the direction we've received from outside counsel about um, not commenting or getting into the facts, which I, I don't believe Dr. Chu did. She appropriately indicated our, our commitment to doing the right thing, but we are, if you could speak to that, you can speak on perhaps the difference between your role operationally and ours and why we are limited and what we can uh, essentially investigate, dig into, and comment on 
And so we would all appreciate that if you could make that distinction. And I know you also were interested in saying a few words, so we would invite them at this time. Thank you. I, I would certainly be more than willing to do that. So let me switch, uh, switch hats. Uh, for just a moment, I'm looking over at Janine Thorne uh, because this afternoon we finished a taping of uh, basically a Q&A between uh, Jeff Lowell and myself uh, trying to do two things. Uh, one was to make as transparent as we can to the public what the Title IX rules and policies and practice really looks like and why it looks like it does. And, and how it's evolved. I, I believe, I don't know what the edited version will look like. I think we were about 30 minutes long on this Q&A today. Uh, but we, we tried to offer what I will call transparency to what, it's not just a title, but Title IX is the mechanism both by federal law and state law and in our, in our district that governs how we would handle sexual harassment Sexual assault is a subcategory of sexual harassment under those rules and definitions. And uh, we have a process underway. And one of the things we try to, to emphasize through the Q&A is to help people understand that, that the rules are there to say that we are a school system working with juveniles, working with children, working with young people and our obligation is to all uh, if there happens to be a, an allegation and that involves another student it's not one where the district can immediately say well of, of course we we used to have a strong stand on uh, against sexual harassment and harassment and bullying of any kind but until that allegation until the process and investigation is done we have two juvenile kids and we have responsibilities to both. Uh, the obvious nature of that is that while that's going on, it appears that the district is somewhat tone deaf. Why, why doesn't it sound more like the district fully understands the, the, the damage that is done by sexual harassment and sexual assault and uh, the ongoing needs so we tried to answer that also in this Q&A from a standpoint of uh, meeting all the requirements for all the students, keeping them safe, having safe plans, uh, doing the proper investigation, and, and not immediately going to a place that assumes that uh, even though you just reported it today, I'll assume that there's uh, somebody who's guilty and somebody who's uh, a victim, and we'll, we'll deal with it that way. So school districts are in a very, I think, uh, uh, a very different place than perhaps some of the other agencies, but all of us need to make sure that, that it's fair and it's diligent and it's, uh, it's a rigorous process that has all the appellate pieces built in. So I'm hoping, and I, I would certainly ask Janine to join me in her, any comments if she has them, but. I, w I would hope that we've, we've been trying to find ways to add to the nature of how do we communicate with our our young people, the young people who are here tonight, uh, the, the parents, uh, the community at large, that in fact we take it very serious. There, I would begin and end every conversation with uh, the fact that the district's commitment to uh, stop harassment and intimidation and bullying of all types, but certainly including the uh, of a sexual nature. Uh, that's not something we can walk away from it. And we have a duty to protect our young people on, on all sides. We also have a duty to educate kids, uh, uh, even with a safe plan and a safety plan. It, and, we have a very complicated set of expectations, but a very good set that would say if and when it's determined that there is a victim and a perpetrator, that there is a proper way to handle that in the schools and, and, and who has to be there and how do you protect the, the victim. So I would, I guess in the answer, President Seema, thank you for giving me a chance to, to say that. Uh, we're going to continue to try to provide as much information to people to understand the process, to understand the people, the, the training behind it, the legality, 
and the fact that uh, these rules that we're following and even the procedures and policies were, were modified uh, just a couple of years ago and, and basically are reviewed every single year. These are not old policies, old practices. The federal government changed the rules a couple, three years ago to ensure that there was more protection for the uh, alleged perpetrator because in their investigation, they believe there was too much one-sided that immediately it presumed guilt on the part of uh, the alleged perpetrator and that there needed to be a stronger process to, uh, to protect them at least during the investigation. And, and interestingly enough, uh, that accusation, let's say on the streets or in the hallways or in the public, uh, without an investigation in itself becomes harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And it fits the definition that you, you cannot allow that and, and when it's unsubstantiated. And that puts us in a very difficult position in terms of trying to investigate and until there's a conclusion, how do we make sure young people are safe and protected. So okay, I think I've gone on a little long, but thank you. For let's, let's, let's um, even though we're over time and we are, why don't we um, just, if we could, Mike, just reset the clock to 10 minutes, we'll use up our break. If that's okay, I'm going to assume our board members are in agreement there. Let's take the 10 minutes to allow questions. Why don't we start just alphabetically? I'll start with Jane. Do you have any questions or comments? I do uh, regarding the current topic that you're talking about, and I know there's a you know concern of you know communication component that is a huge uh, thing amongst parents and at large as well as students. Um, is there a place where I, I guess how how can we help as a board to create that fluidity in communication? Is there something that we can do other than policy? Okay, so how, how mm, let me rephrase this. No, that's all right. You know, let me think about how to better phrase this so it's more appropriate. To skip me and come back to because I do want to address this. Christine, Dr. Chu. Christine is fine, please. Um, I, I. I have a few comments. I'm not sure there's a question in here. I think more comments. So I appreciate um, the work that's being done to clarify what we do have in place. And I'm grateful for our superintendent and our staff for doing that. I, I do want to point out that um, this is not an issue of sides and it's not an issue of equivalencies of one versus the other. There are multiple things at play and it's not one versus another. Um, so I've been thinking about our sexual harassment, assault, racial um, harassment, discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and the importance of creating safe environments for our students. And there are a whole host of other harassment and um, discrimination and assault issues. We have about five policies in that area, and we have changed them multiple times over the years. And I think one of the most significant changes that we made was that we recognize that the reporter, the survivor, the victim, the, the complainant, that person has a need and their family for follow-up and support through the process. So we tried to put that in to the policy. And I think that, um, you know, people ask why, why am I focused on goals and outcomes? Because we've changed because we do things like change policies multiple times and iterations over years, but we don't get the outcomes that we need. And the district invests a lot of resources and care. And the fact that our community thinks that we don't care is reflective of an ineffective change. It's an incomplete change. And it's not to point fingers at a staff member or a board member. It is a complex system. And, and so I do think that we can have some conversations and we can update policies. I believe that there are two major policy opportunities for us in this space at this time, um, and I'll just identify them. The two major policy opportunities that I see are one 
is getting a lot more explicit about what it means to deal with the technicalities of a complaint versus the support of the students involved, both the reporter and the um, per alleged perpetrator of the issue, and making sure that we have clarity in what it means to support and communicate and follow up with them. And we don't need to write the specifics of that, but I think we may be do a better job in our policy of articulating those those Can I? expectations. And I, I want to just finish because it's, I, I, yeah, I'd rather finish. The second is, um, I think there is an opportunity in our policies to think differently about what we mean about training. I don't think that our staff are as prepared as we want them to be. They are not bad people. They are not trying to hide from these things happening to our kids. Their hearts cry out to help our kids as well. And yes, in certain cases, they feel overwhelmed or threatened by the whole process and they need support for that. But they also need the training to deal with this in a different way and not technical training, like not like we checked the box. I attended this two hour thing and I got it, but like really internalizing these values about how we take care of students and people ask, you know, why the focus on goals? Well, this is one and why my frustration with the governance oversight piece? This is another place where we did our lane. We stayed in our lane and we updated the policy and we sent it out and it didn't get implemented. And we were like, well, we're kind of disappointed. Well, well, I'm more than disappointed. That can't happen. But it's not me saying, hey, district employees, you just can't do this right. It's me saying, hey, district employees, what kind of support? What kind of support do you need so that we can make sure that you're in a position to execute on this and how can we plan to revisit our policies or whatever it is that we do for you so that we can propel this forward together and i know that my frustrations often come across as just a critique but they're really an invitation and they're intended as an invitation to say i'm frustrated with our system i bet you are too let us change it and then let us monitor it and let us keep an eye on it and let us be honest about whether we got what we wanted so I think we could do some changes on the policies. And I think my last thing on this is, I kind of wonder if the, I, I appreciate that the district is explaining what's currently in place. I'm wondering what the district is also doing right now to support this group who, whose pain level is going up and up and up because they feel so unheard and they are survivors of pretty significant things, not always in the schools or because of our schools, but it's a thing that's happening to students that is affecting their learning in our schools. And so my question kind of is, what are we doing on the ground right now to sort of work with these kids? Because I know that I would love to go meet with them, but I'm right now serving on the disciplinary appeals committee. I can't take a risk of going and talking to folks and, and end up discussing the thing I'm on an appeal for or something that we might get another appeal for. And that kind of is a terrible feeling because I feel like they need that connection right now and they need us to understand more deeply their experiences so that what we do to support them is more relevant. So I, I do, so I think there's a place for the board. And then finally, um, Dr. Jarvis and I talked and there may also be spaces in my external advocacy we all do some of that, but I have a particular group and some particular work. There may be some opportunities for us to take this issue up across a broader system since it's clearly not limited to our school district. This is not the problem of our school district, but it is the opportunity of our school district to do better by our kids and to collaborate with others to do better. So those are the things I wanted to say. And if there's an answer to the small question, that's great. Yeah, on the training, I think that was the piece where I was going to try to jump in as I feel like training is where like I, I don't know we could write 12 more policies. That's not. We we reviewed the HIB. I think you're one of the people who helped draft the language um, a few years ago, and so we thought we had it right, but I don't know. I, I think there's the opportunity to change it further to reflect more intently on sexual assault. I thought many of the comments that were made tonight were well, um, well received, well thought through. I think the issue is training. What I've not figured out from what you just said is, were you um, saying that that we, with you included, as a board, didn't do enough? Were you saying you had um, directed comments in the past to Dr. Duran because it wasn't? 
Ivan, it was it wasn't art here, and you felt that they didn't follow through, or is it just sort of a general frustration, which I, I do appreciate that, no, I which think, is I think there's a gap between what we had wanted the district to do and what actually ended up in the experiences that these students are describing. My intent is that yeah. the execution is not yet at a place where it needs to be. It's not a you, you didn't do it. It's a it's not there yet. Are we going to look at it? So that's why the monitoring, that's why we set like we put a policy in place. The expectation is we're going to look at it and see if it's effective. And I don't think we're doing that piece. And I think if we did and then the and then and we turns out it wasn't doing it, it wasn't having the impact that we wanted, then the district would be in a position to like already be engaged in, in changing it. And, and I don't know that it's there may be a role for the board to play in the policy, but it may turn out that it's like the answer lies in the data, the follow up and the relationship with our students so that we have a constant flow of understanding. OK, I, I know you want to speak, Dr. Jarvis. However, um, uh, Joyce has not had a chance to speak, nor has Carolyn. So I, I do want to make sure. Um, please, Joyce, if you had comments, please go ahead. Same with uh, Carolyn. I'll try to be try to be brief. Oh, I have oh, I have an echo. Why don't we let, don't we let Carol first and I'll see if I can. Actually echoing on our side. It might be on your side, but we don't hear your echo. OK, I can try. It's a little um, OK. It's gone away. All right. Uh, um, as Christine has gone through a lot of the comments that I probably would have had as well, I'll try to keep this brief. One thing that I'll um, mention is that when um, Christine talked about the need of survivors to have follow up, I'd like to just add that it is a right and a moral right, you know, setting aside whether it is a legal right, there is definitely a responsibility on our part as fiduciaries of taking care of um, children who have uh, suffered these assaults, harassment, sexual assaults to um, make sure that we adequately support them and that that's what I wanted to just add and we'll continue that work outside of this meeting, but appreciate the comments that were made during the meeting and appreciate the districts. Um, I, I understand that there are many complex um, issues and convergence of different laws and rights, but would like to just make sure that we um, keep close track of the survivors and, and their need and their right to have that support. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Carolyn. Well, um, I'd like to say that um, I was really struck by the demands the students made. I had seen them earlier on social media, and I think they they really thought through a lot of things. And um, the one that really got to me right away was the, the form, the lack of a specific form for this, and then the questions on the form that already put you in um, not a good place. So um, I was thinking that if to approach this problem, we have an operational piece, we have a policy piece, we have, uh, I, I assume those are all done with well intentions. I was part of the, when we did the HIP policy, uh, good intentions, but something's not working out right on the ground. And so I was thinking, we need to step through it in a partnership. The policy people, that's the board and the operations people, from the point of view of the of a student, on the ground and just like what are those interactions like I take the form what oh I read the form what do I do who do I talk to how does that go and we could find that out you know maybe by interviewing students or kind of doing a a test of the process to find out where we can change our policies how are you done Carolyn yeah oh, uh, but I also wanted to add thank you to the bus drivers I know this is um you know I but we didn't have any more time um and they're doing better than the, the surrounding districts. And I appreciate that. And thank you to the nurses um, for everything they're going through. Jane, please. Well, I, Chris, and I really appreciate it. I think you pretty much summarized a lot of my thoughts, but I do want to put in two cents on, um, I think, let me think here. I wrote these things down. I know that we have five policies that are impacted right now. And that's 3207 HIV, 3250 sexual harassment, 3210 discrimination, 4220 complaints, and 3041 discipline. I do think, I know that we have gone through these, but in light of 
what's happening right now and all the new information. I do think it is it is a good idea to put it in our docket of agenda and and uh, absolutely agree and address it. You know, uh, within you know relatively, you know, in, in a timely manner. And um, with that in mind, I do agree with Carolyn that we do need to look at how do we work with all the different layers of our partnership. As obviously we wear the policy hat, but there's got to be a better fluidity in this. And because obviously they're they're you know, with us all being humans, we make errors. How do we eliminate some of that error so that we it's it's done well, so we have the students who are in this position. Um, it would be great if we don't have any of these students in this position. It's just wrong. So thank oh, you. But I do want to say echo on the uh, I yeah, thank you to the bus drivers and the nurses. I know they're overworked and but I do have one question regarding um, uh, HR, I, I, you know, I celebrate the fact that we have increased uh, staff in diversity. I'd, I would love to hear what is what helped increase that and how can we increase that even more because the proportion is still off. Yes, I, on, I just want to be the, mindful. Um, we, yeah, on this the will come out of our committee discussion, so I just want to be everybody be aware of that. But I, I don't want to cut people off in terms of their opportunity to discuss this stuff. But I just want to let you know I we've got limited time on the on the HR piece. I did have two questions, so if you're if you, I'll just tag them on to that. Um, in addition to sort of what's what's helping us move that forward, one of the pieces of data we don't talk about much, and I don't. I, I might have missed it, but I didn't see it in the report, is what's the average tenure by race and so forth, as opposed to simply like the numbers. So we we kind of kept our diversity over time, which is great, but I'm kind of wondering because I know we lost a lot of, of um, folks of color from our district in different spaces, and I wonder, um, thinking about not just recruitment, but also retention. And I know Jeff thinks about that too, so no, no, um, not thinking that he missed the obvious, but I, we don't talk about it. So I'd like to understand that a little bit at some point, maybe not tonight. And also thinking about the pipeline, we talk a lot about the fact that many of our lower paying, um, lower level, lower requirement for certification and education jobs bring in a different diversity of people. And we don't talk much about how we actively create a pipeline. Like, are we helping our paras to become cert certificated professionals should they want to be? Or, or other um, in other industries, there are many places where we we have different levels of certification and and education required. How do we actively change that? Is is one of the things I wonder. I would like us to have on our radar. And uh, thank okay. you also to the nurses and the the transportation staff. So you have several questions, Dr. Jarvis. You have only just, a few minutes to I'm answer them. A, a yeah. very brief response. Okay. Just the only thing I do want to just say as a public statement is you said something about three nurses being allocated, but we have 20. I think I want everybody to know the reason we have the extra 20 is because of our levy, our levy dollars. And if we don't renew our levy dollars, that kind of support is something we would lose. Um, because it's a renewal of our levy. So we would lose nurses at that rate, which already feels inadequate. So I just wanted to make sure that, that was clear. I just wanted to acknowledge that in some of your quest for information, whether it's to do with what can be done, what else is happening besides investigations, uh, there is information that I need to get back to you about efforts. And uh, I suspect every one of our high school principal that may be watching this or really our staff here would jump up and right now and start to talk about some things that are underway and, and come. so I will get more information to you on that one. Secondly, as I, I was watching this, Dr. Thomas as you were asking a couple of those questions and I, I was almost surprised he didn't jump up and wave his hand. Uh, I'm not going to call him at this point, but I think your point is well taken. Uh, what are we doing? And and I, it's a story we would also love to tell because I think you'll you'll find that it's not that we can't do more, and particularly as we come out of the the pandemic. But uh, there is work happening to retain our staff, and and uh, it, it's good work. So I can get back to you with more information, particularly directly from some of the staff that's that's greatly involved. Yeah, in I that. heard very specific questions and what we can do in our takedown is 
make sure we have them listed. Um, I have, I guess, a question for you to add to your list. Um, we had students say that they were asked what caused this, which is a shift of blame. It can sound like come and explain to me how you got yourself into this situation, which is the exact opposite one would want to give to a victim. I don't believe that's in our HIB policy anywhere. So I would like to ask, as you do your investigation, as you determine what the facts are in terms of how things are being actioned on the ground, what might be happening that has made it somehow a protocol or a practice? Because several of them are saying this is occurring. Is that at a school level? Is that just a particular person? Because it's not something that this board sanctioned or, or created. So that's just something to, to find out. Um, and the other thing I'm just going to ask our board members, um, I think tonight we heard about let's put on our list for policy review um, our, our school improvement plan, but we also clearly have this topic of how do we do we have adequate policies for today's concerns as articulated tonight and in the last few weeks. So I'm just asking, because we need to prioritize, am I hearing from, from you, and I'm just reading from all of you, that um, you would like the SIP review a little bit later? Do we want to do these concurrently? I just want to get a read from you, since we're all here and talking about these policies. Um, one could imagine waiting to get more feedback so that we have the most amount of input before we revisit policies. Um, which would suggest maybe later in the spring on this, we could also imagine saying, let's do this immediately um, and before we do other policies. So I'm asking each of you to give me a sense of your preference. Because maybe that way start I, with I can, yeah, oh, I, I'll, I'll Joyce, start with sorry. Joyce uh, because we don't want to have the alphabetical ordering leave you out. <laughs> Um, but I think it's essentially, we know that when we have extra work that we do, we're creating board study sessions or study time, and it helps if we know what are we trying to achieve for a given one. So if I'm trying to put together a list and trying to focus us, where do we want to put these in terms of timing, knowing that we care about all of them, but we may get information at different moments about them. I would say that the issue is really important. However, I'm not convinced that the policies need revision. We find often that people try to legislate a solution by changing the policy, but there is something that can be done and a lot of things that can be done operationally without a change. And so I, I, I guess that I'm not convinced that we need a study session to do that, but I need to defer to people who are more familiar. Jane? Go ahead, Christine. Okay, Christine. Yeah. Or actually, so I, I'm I sorry. Let let me have Carolyn because I I think I'm I want to make sure I'm being balanced. Let me go the other direction, Carolyn. Okay. Well, if we're talking about SIPs versus um, sexual harassment, um, which policies we're looking at? I think that that the SIPs can wait because people are uh, going ahead. Is what I heard with what they're doing in the schools. Um, but I do want to look at them because um, I've been trying to read them all and it's uh, it's doing me in. Um, but uh, in terms of the sexual harassment policies and things, we do, I think we do need to, like I said, try to step through it from, this, from the point of view of a student to uncover what it is. And so how we would do that, um, that might take some time. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think we need to talk about how we could potentially even do that. Okay, so um, I think um, I'm not sure I would frame the question as such. So I, I think that the, the answer, and I really like what Carolyn's sort of saying about this multi components, and I, I couldn't agree more with Joyce about where the, where the most important changes need to start. I, I do think the policy has an opportunity to give better direction. So um, what I would ask is, when is the most effective time for both of those policy issues to be visited? And first, and secondly, um, 
when is um, is it really necessary to think of them as additional pieces? It is possible that we should think about our, our board work and prioritize a little bit. Like what I think we'll have an opportunity to do that when we talk about committees and talk about what, you know, what is it that our, our goals are for the board for this year? And is this something that we want to take more precedence or is, does this fit with something else? I, I don't know that thinking of it just as a tack on opportunity has to happen that way, but there's just a thought. Um, and then for the, for the timing, I, I see lots of opportunities for immediate action to be taken. Like if that form truly does ask victims of sexual um, assault to say why they think it happened to them, we should either be making that immediately optional in a form or we should be like just taking it off the form. And, and we can have lots of investigations, but I feel like that's an operational space. And I, so I guess my gut says, I'd love to see the operational stuff move ahead and then come back and tell us, here are the things we've been able to do. Here are the open questions we have. Here's what we think is, is not being executed the way we want in our current policy. And here's where we might need some policy support. And then we might we might open up some other ideas because we could ask them, you know, hey, Carolyn had asked if you can do a start to finish exercise. Can you share that with us? OK, so that I, that's one thing. And then on the other piece of the school improvement plans. Later is fine, but really it's superintendent. When do you need us to weigh in on that well, in order that, for it that to be we useful? Do have. That, that we do. I was just trying to get a sense of that, and I think that is fine because we do need to get a sense of where things are operational versus the gap being policy because the policy was actually drafted you know by, by you and me and others just not that long ago so um so let's let's move forward we are due for a break um i suggest we take literally a two minute break and we revisit um to start with our board business which we will have to condense pretty quickly oh, wait, sorry please just just one second yeah. so regarding i i do i want to uh, yeah chime in on that. I do think all the comments regarding operational piece, I do hope the district will look at it and be a little bit more expeditious as to see whether or not those components exist. If not, would they be helpful in making sure it's a little bit more thorough so we don't have any oopses in our system? And as far as the policy is concerned, um, I'm actually, you know, I understand that, you know, I understand what Joyce is saying, but I do think given yeah, what we don't know, we don't know. And as I keep saying this, but what we do know, we do know. And right now we have no more information than we did before. And I understand that certain policies were already reviewed within the last couple of years. I don't think it will hurt us. It will only help us to go through it with a different perspective that we have today. And so I don't necessarily think we should be holding it off too late because the longer we move away from what is happening right now, it becomes more of a a memory thing that we may diminish it that we won't be as useful. So I think it is important that we do it in a timely manner. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to stand in recess for um, two minutes until 6.05. Thank you.
I'm sorry. Joyce, are you with us? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I know Carolyn will join us momentarily. I think at this time I'm we are going to start. Um, uh, we're going to pick up on item seven, which is board business. I would like to give this um, the time we had planned for, but I'm also mindful that we have a study session for which staff has prepared um, that starts at 630. So I'm going to um, make a motion that for um, item seven, oh, excuse me, we're going to pick up with item six, which is our committee work discussion. Um, to be able to give it at least 20 minutes, which I feel like it is due, um, I'm going to propose that we um, carry over item seven, which is our board business and our discussion of our committee and liaison engagement to our January 6th meeting. We do have time at, from 2.30 to 4, a study session, and we will be able to, I think, start that at that time. We have simply run out of time tonight. I, I will second your motion. Thank you. Um, am I going to, I'm seeing nodding, so by unanimous consent, I'm going to go ahead and say that we approve that. And let's start with our discussion of our committee work. I'm going to go ahead and call on Christine to, um, we have 20 minutes to take us through the multilingual learner policy, which is an important one. It's up for second reading. If I'm incorrect, and that's Carolyn, correct me, but I believe it's Christine who might be able to it, walk us it through. It is Christine, and I thought we had two policies tonight, but I only see one. You decided not to bring the other one. Okay, that's fine. I thought, I thought, all right, that's fine. So um, we took the multilingual learner policy back. Um, I'm not going to walk you through a lot, so this is pretty brief. Um, we took it back for two reasons. One, the first time it came to the board was ages ago, and it was it was not the same sort of iteration. So we considered the first go. And the second reason we took it back was um, you had asked that the staff and the committee go ahead and do a review and say, is there anything inherent in this policy that based on what experiences we just had with them, um, the immersion and dual language programming decisions, is there something that this this policy is doing wrong or could do better or what have you. And frankly, there wasn't there wasn't anything significant found in that light. We really did take that lens to it. Um, Chitra is is uh, very thoughtful and has been consulting. I, I just want to iterate again because this is a place where I see um, a deep level of stakeholder engagement. I don't know if it's exactly perfect or I'm sure there are ways it could be better, but this is a place where I've really watched a policy get developed by staff in a way that is is just really reflective of respecting our stakeholders. And I, I just want to say that again. So um, so the modifications were made, but frankly, the modifications that were just made um, from first reading were there because the state made some rule changes. Um, Could I just ask if we maybe project the marked copy um, oh, sure. just for the value of those who are watching and maybe Christine, as you speak, you don't have to go through every line edit, but if you want to flag the things that you think are most salient, um, either in the clean version or the marked, um, that might help. Um, so I think one of them is simply like if you scroll down to the bottom of the first page, we're going to call it the multilingual education program because we want to think more holistically about it. Um, and I'm going to keep looking up to Chitra. I, I kind of wonder if we should just have her up here, but we want to keep it brief. So um, that was really the primary major change that was made from the last time. Um, and the other thing we wanted to talk about was that um, it, we did make an addition that we thought was more reflective of what we wanted to do. If you look at the bottom of page one in the second to last paragraph before the district didn't staff, there's a yellow highlight that says regardless of program enrollment and that generated a lot of a discussion, but it's really important because we're talking about the district is committed to high quality, rigorous instructional materials and pedagogy that are aligned that engage MLLs accelerated access to grade level content. And that should be regardless of what program they're enrolled in, whether they're enrolled in an immersion program, if they're enrolled in an advanced learning program, it doesn't really matter if they're in our general education program all of our students who are multilingual learners should have that. The other thing that I will mention is that there is probably an inclination for the long term 
that we do believe that great global citizens are multilingual. We did not make greater changes to this policy at this time to really reflect that for two reasons. One, we can only roll out so many changes at once and, and we don't have the funds or the vision, you know, the established vision yet of exactly how that would look. And, and we would want to involve stakeholders in it. And two, um, we don't want to take away from these changes first because these changes about really serving our multilingual learners in a more comprehensive way um, that really takes them through their full course is important, are important. So that's it. Those are the only changes Thank made. You. We can take questions or concerns, but we'd like to just get this passed so that there's no ambiguity about our direction in this space. Hey, so did, I, did I miss anything major? I'm going to start with uh, Joyce this time. Are there any questions? No questions or comments. Thank you. OK, Jane. No, I don't have any. OK, Carolyn. Yeah, I just really want to say thank you because I think I was the, one of the people who was worried last time about how this policy intersects with, you know, Spanish immersion, dual language and all of that. And so I asked if we could review it and and it seems that you did and it says this you know, you have a paragraph there that you were asked to review it and uh, about for those concern community concerns and and so forth. So uh, thank you for doing that. Well, thank John for that because he's the one who put that material together. But we all like Chitra did the lion's share on the policy. So that's great. I'm going to go ahead and motion that I, I'll need a second because I don't I have second. a second committee member that we approve this um, as presented. I second. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 I hearing uh, no uh, opposing, we are passing um, the amendment to 2110. Thank you, Chitra and John, and thank you, board. OK, let's move to item 6.2. I'm going to just tee this up by saying that um, this was reflective of the great work of uh, Melissa, John, and uh, as well as Christine, and I'd say small contribution by me, we all uh, worked to give our feedback on how we were going to be presenting our legislative priorities. And I think the, um, the high level of this is we agreed on uh, the four items that you see at the top, the enrollment relief, transportation funding, local levy, limit reform, and the supplement um, ESSER funds. But we were thinking about the value of this um, tool as a way of educating people, essentially, how could we go further on any number of one of the topics? So, so we were looking at this. Sorry, can I interrupt to ask for those please, who are streaming in to um, uh, provide it projected? Great, great suggestion. Um, could we project this um, document, please? It's the attachment to 6.2. And folks can find it online too, but if you're here and struggling to find it, that would be awesome to projected here. That's a good call out and I appreciate you flagging what, what we don't what we can't see that you don't see. <laughs> so Thanks. the bottom line is this document is being shared in this way because it's the stuff of which I think many people know off the top of their head, but we want it to be more widely known by board members as well as people in our community. I think Melissa's on the line. I don't know if Melissa has anything to say about it. So let me pause for a second. I'm going to say maybe we'll give her a chance. Let me let then Christine speak. So I, this is our um, proposed legislative priorities for our, our district and our board this year. And we do want the board to vote on them, but not tonight. We probably want you to vote in January, but we wanted you to see them. So we just got a new copy of this. Melissa and John worked on it. We just got this on Tuesday. So we haven't had a powwow to like say, is there any more revision? But in essence, what we're trying to do is take the information from our legislators and our lobbyists about what we think are the most actionable and critical, like high impact things to the district. There are many things that we need from our legislature and that are worthy of our advocacy. These, This is the short list of the stuff that we think has potential and that we think is absolutely critical. Most of it is about funding right now. But there, well, I guess it's all, if you, in the end, it's all about funding because without that support, we can't do things. Um, but I, we may retitle that section called On Our Radar. But the what we wanted to acknowledge is that social, emotional, 
services and funding and supports from the state are going to be critical now and forever. And um, also the special education funding are critical. So the others are the things. This is not a session where the budget is being done. So financial asks are going to be hard to come by. So we'll struggle and we'll get whatever we can. So that's where this comes from. And um, uh, yeah, the budget. What, one thing just to clarify that the, what things were going to be our priorities. You're right. The board, this board have not voted on, but the two of us had already agreed as what was goal comp that we agreed with this. I think what is net new as of Tuesday, in fairness to the to Melissa and John, is just we had asked them to build out supporting slides for each one of these priorities so that we and those who we shared this with would have depth as well as kind of the breadth of. Oh, the yeah, way. I didn't mean to yeah. intimate yeah, I just want to make sure it was clear that like, we were I, all on a We page. have two new board directors, so I wanted them to understand like once a year for the past few years, we've started to vote on having a legislative set of priorities. And so this and we do it in conjunction with our district. We don't have one board set and one district set and we do it together and we and consult lobbyists and uh, legislators and anyone and everyone we can that would help us figure it out. So that's what this is. And um, we really would love feedback so that if there's any um, or questions so that we can make any adjustments. And then I don't know if it will go on the consent agenda or if it will be an agenda item in January, but we really I'm want gonna, this. I'm going to ask if we would consider voting on this as legislative priorities now, um, even if the format of the PowerPoint changes. Because and some of the wording. I would say like yeah, on, if only the, because this is the spirit of what we reflect. Yeah, only because I think there's there's um there's implications to us not yep. getting behind it in terms of timing and being able to impact the upcoming session. So I will make that motion and I understand if not everybody's in favor of it. But I'll second your motion and just give like the caveat that the well if you could make the motion in a way that it's clear like I think the motion is that we as a board approve this set of priorities and give latitude for um, revisions in wording and and or document organization. And I second your motion. Okay, <laughs> that away. Basically, what we're voting to approve is the first page of this PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They still changed even the words on the first page, but yeah. All right. Pretty close. Meaning the actual articulation of what the uh, what the priorities are, because that I think enables us to take actions and that's supported by the board. So I can say this is the recommendation that's come from um, Melissa, John, Christine and me having seen, as Christine said, what is realistic as well as what's pressing in our district and what the limitations of the upcoming session are. So and it also reflects our board's priorities over time. Carolyn, you can see that um, one of the things you've brought up multiple times is the importance of counseling staff, nursing staff at our schools. Yep. And I believe that that is included in the prototypical school model staffing requirements. And, and I think that that's one that we can't leave out, even if we can't get it right away or completely. We just can't afford to leave it out. OK, I'm just going to let Mike know that, as I understand it, the PowerPoint is not visible still to those who are maybe watching the meeting, and I'm not sure what we can do, but it is attached. Yeah. Yes, it is visible. Nice. Yes, it is visible. This is Melissa. OK, okay. All right. this is Joyce and I am um, streaming or watching and I don't know if I see a different screen, but I, I don't see it. I still see the um, multilingual education program. Being projected. OK, so Mike is wondering if it's maybe there's a delay, but with that, why don't we go ahead and vote on this? Um, all those in favor of approving the agenda as as outlined by uh, sorry, the legislative priorities as outlined um, by Christine. Aye. 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 Looks like a really neat job to me. Yep. Yeah. And I, I thank uh, Melissa and John for that work. It was yeah. quite a, quite valuable. So with that, I think I'm going to go to 6.3 and uh, we have about eight, uh, six and a half minutes left, but I'd like to ask Carolyn if you would please take us through the board equity oh, and accountability wow. commitments, um, unless you prefer. It, yeah. um, 
Okay, so Christine and I, whoops, Christine and I worked on this together, and actually, you know, this is a little hard to do in just a, a few minutes because um, what we're basically um, saying is our policy said that uh, every year we would come up with new targets for what we wanted to um, accomplish as a board or commit to as a board, and I think eventually these actually can be um, uh, narrowed down to a few points, but um, so so what we're asking you to do is agree with all of these things and approve this chart tonight. And it's kind of a there's kind of a lot on here. So um, for system wide direction, we have make we have we commit to trying to make sure that the critical criteria are um, as as it says here more pervasive and done in everything, and then. Um, we still commit to student well-being connectedness, um, removing barriers, identifying barriers. So you can so you can read down through this this chart. And um, I did think it, it kind of boiled down to a few things, which are um, see if I can remember, but uh, things that the board can actually do, and that is monitoring the critical criteria. We've talked about that before. Um, make, keeping all of this top of mind when we're doing uh, policy work. Um, you know, equity reviews of board policy. So it's, and then um, also committing to keeping ourselves um, up to speed on equity in the sense of, but then we have a new state law that is going to require us to do equity training as board members. What do I, what am I you missed one. What did I miss? Annual plan, like making oh, plans. So. Okay, yeah, that that we have equity. Um, throughout um, that and that we do our governance part of like ensuring that it's actually executed. The parts that are relevant to equity are represented and executed. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You started by saying you're not sure if we have, I mean, we have four minutes and if this is, I don't want to give this a short shrift and just pass it. So I think a question is, um, is it important that we pass this tonight versus January 6th? And well, is there was, a discussion it was or in August? <laughs> so okay, okay, so I'm I'm unclear because this was not. Let me let me put some context yeah. to it. Yeah, I think we I need to understand. So the context here why, is why are we? Yeah, what yeah. are we looking at tonight, and timeline. what's the actual need for tonight versus having a more thorough discussion and perhaps having some edits if right. if more one or sure. more of us want input on changes. So it, I think that the the value of doing this tonight is to get some initial input, and if. If there's no major initial input, we should just pass it and be done with it because we are way overdue for having something. But doing it in January is is fine. This is to be clear what this is in our policy on equity. The board and the the board has made on the behalf of the district and the board has made on behalf of itself a series of promises. And um, those are the things that we have promised our community. Right. I'm trying to use the Carolyn and I had had a conversation about language and we said these co commitments really reflect promises that we would take care of these things. And so these are the things that we said we do, but they're broad. And so what the policy requires is that each year we choose some specific targets that we will look at to make sure that we are making progress or at the very least, if we're not making progress on something that we're not losing ground. So Caroline and I went through all of the board commitments and said, what, what are the things we'll do to support each of these? And it turns out that thematically there are, it's a many to many mapping and um, several of them are covered by the same things like critical criteria, like really truly getting deeper and more effective about that will m help us advance multiple of these issues making sure that we hold to the things we commit to in the annual plan um, will help us make progress on these issues. So we tried to come up with the criteria that we thought were realistic and that also allowed us to focus because in the past I think we've tried to do too much and the board hasn't had full ownership of it because it's just like yeah yeah we'll do that that sounds good but it's not like the fabric of what they're doing. And so we tried this time to take a different tact and to say, in what ways can the board as a consolidated unit, as a governance body, really get behind these promises and really make some progress on them on this year? And so here are the things that we kind of came up with that we thought would be a good focus for this year. 
And Caroline, the only part that I accurate? don't see is I don't see how it, except for um, C target for commitment A, I didn't see how it was more focused. I did like that you have the actual target, but I just, that was okay. one area where I wasn't clear. So, um, so the overall policy, the um, equity policy, you have, I don't know uh, if you've memorized it, but you have um, board commitments and then you have commitments of the district. You have these two sections. So, um, and so then it's, there's a task for each of us. So there's a task for the board to go through every year, look at those commitments and say how we're gonna try to do it this year. And then the same thing on the district side, they have a piece they need to do, which they're gonna, uh, I think, wrap into the annual plan and we have to monitor that, but we need to see that the commitments that are on, on their side in the equity policy are also addressed. So that's what we're doing here. We're trying to, um, get everybody to sort of buy into uh, some targets for what would have been this year if we could have started in August, but for this school year. Um, so that's what the goal of this is. Okay, well, I am happy to take a motion to pass this tonight, but I wanna make sure I start with our two new board members. If they want to carry this over to January to give them more time or input or opportunity to revise, I wanna make sure that's that's been heard. Carolyn? Oh, I had one more thought. I mean, they might want to get involved with maybe um, looking at the the equity policy again and, um, you know. Well, I, I thought the critical criteria, I mean, you've heard me say this, I'm slightly worried that our critical criteria may need another iteration so that, um, and I don't, we could do that a number of ways, but I, right. That doesn't. That's not at very. That, that's not at variance with passing this. No, but um, what I'm th what I am thinking is that we might be able to tighten up the board commitment part um, down to some things that might stand the test of time more. But that's something like, you know, uh, I think a lot of us might be interested in working on that. So. Well, let me just cut to the chase and ask uh, Joyce and Jane each mm -hmm. in that order. We'll, we'll do Joyce first and then Jane. Would you like? to move forward tonight, would you prefer to wait for whatever reason? I'm fine with moving forward tonight. Okay, Jane. Uh, just a quick question. So what is the next step after, if we were to do this today? Uh, well, then we have to live up to it. We, we, we would know, probably start we, to build out, how, wouldn't we need to apply? Well, as the board, we are saying here, we're gonna, we're gonna be asking for critical criteria when things come forward and we're going to, um, you know, double check the annual plan for equity things. And it's it's things we're saying we're going to do. So, so, so it would basically be a, a lens over which yeah. we would look through everything we're going to do in the next six months. So the yeah. only difference would be tonight's meeting versus January. But I, not hearing anybody say they're going to make material change, I'd probably propose that we um, pass this tonight. Yeah. So I'll motion that we um, pass or approve the presented equity targets for the year. Um, and then I do have an answer to your question, Seema, if someone seconds this. I okay. second. Okay, your your question, Seema, was how does this, how is this a consolidation? How is this more concise? And no one answered that. So the there instead of having um, a bunch of separate policies and things called out and all different, like every this looks at um, the goals, if you look like A and F, and um, there's at least three of them that have the critical criteria. So what we tried to do was like, it may be, it may appear a little bit differently, but if you look at B and you look at C and you look at um, E, those are all about the annual plan and our, our role and oversight of the annual plan. So really it's us committing to provide the appropriate oversight via the annual plan and via critical criteria that the things that we've committed to and promised are being done and then the other pieces that we as a board will continue to learn and become even more facile and able to help our, our community. And I think those were the big things that, that, that were themed here. So that's how it's a theme. Okay, so well, thank you. I would say just, I have an interest in passing this tonight only in that if it's set, then as I try to develop board development and study session activities, I, I'm working with something that's been approved and then that's then a lens I can apply. So I would say for that, I'm supportive of taking a vote. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
I, I hearing no objection. This passes. And at this time, we will uh, just recess for 30 seconds as we change to um, our study session, which is going to be in the Baker Room. Um, so uh, we are three minutes behind, but not too badly. I do feel like an airline pilot who's going to make up time um, at our destination. So thank you.
At this time, this meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting will be on January 11th, 2022.